Thank you, and hello, everyone. Um, I think it was mentioned, Aaron mentioned it earlier. Uh, I think I might have been the first presenter at their first conference, if I remember right. Um, and of course, I always felt like I was the bad luck guy because Ben Cooper reminded me that we had some issues with my computer in the presentation and getting the getting it to hook up properly. So I think it took about 20 minutes of a, of a delay. Hopefully we don't get into that situation today. Um, but I presented on penalty kill as well that day, um, but it was a more general approach to it. So this, this time in talking to Aaron, um, I wanted to break it down a little bit more. So it's just one specific area that I'm gonna focus on and it's how you teach and work with your players on exchanges or switches or handoffs, whatever you wanna call, whatever your terminology may be for your team. And do it in a way where you can always apply pressure onto the power play that you're playing against. So um, a couple things here that I'm gonna to touch on with us. There's, there's some different styles to, to penalty kills, as you all know, but the one thing that I will mention first is you see the power plays over the last number of years, especially in the NHL, they seem to be getting better and better every year. I mean, you'll, you'll hear from somebody, uh, I'm not sure if he's presenting tomorrow or when he is, but Glenn Goldson uh, is the guy in, responsible for the power play in Edmonton, and it's been the best power play that the NHL has seen over the course of a regular season. So I think there's a couple reasons why you're seeing a change. One is the type of player. The skill set that those players have now um, is different than what it has been. Um, yes, the guys 10 years ago were creative, they were skilled, they saw the game well. All that's the same, it doesn't change. But what's changed now is these players that are coming up, they don't have the same level of risk. They're not worried about trying different things. And that's why you're seeing it uh, the job for a penalty kill coach being a lot more difficult than it used to be. Um, and it keeps you up at night, especially when in Calgary we knew Edmonton was coming up next and you have to deal with McDavid and Dreisaitl and those guys. So it makes your job a lot more difficult as a penalty kill coach um, because of the way the players are now. But the second thing, and I think it's an underrated point, is how good the coaching is. So everybody will look at that power play for an example and say, yeah, there's the two best players in the world. And for sure, they're unreal. But at the end of the day, Glenn is the guy that finds the little areas that maybe you can exploit against the penalty kill. So how he works with those guys and the relationship that he's built with those guys allows them to form a really strong unit and lets them do what they have to do to be that successful. So power plays have changed, and that's a big reason why. So we all know there's, there's really two styles of penalty kill. I'll call it the aggressive style, which most of this presentation is going to be on because that's what we use in Calgary over the past number of years, and we've had some success with it. Um, and then there's that more passive style. And when I say passive, I don't want you to think of it as, well, we're just sitting back. It's not that at all, but it's that diamond approach that you're seeing more and more teams go to or some sort of version of it. Um, and pretty much two-thirds of the NHL has moved to that approach over the last little while. Um, but there's pros and cons to both. You know, and that's the way I kind of look at it to see how, what's the best for our team or what's the best for our style moving forward. So, of course, with the aggressive style, the pros that I love, you disrupt timing of the power play. You make it difficult on them. You force them to make plays under pressure. You hurry their decisions so they're not clean all the time. The cons against it, if you're late with your pressure or if your reads are off, a power play makes two or three good passes, bang, you give up a grade A chance, and that's not ideal. Um, the second thing with the aggressive style that you have to think about Sometimes you open yourself up to the seam plays, and those are the hardest things to cover a lot when you're forced or when you're asking your players to kill the way we want to play. Um, and then that passive style that's kind of come into play lately. Um, there's a lot of things about it that I do like. Um, you typically don't give up those one timers from the flanks anymore, and there most definitely is less seam attempts because guys really have a, a pretty good idea of where they have to be in that coverage. Um, but the one thing that I'm still not wrapping my head around, we are believers in Calgary about zone time. Power plays have a lot of time in zone. They have more time with the diamond type of kill. Eventually, those good players with time are going to break you down. And that's one thing that I always am a little bit worried about when I think about potentially switching and going to that side of it. I don't want to give good players time to make plays because they will make the plays eventually. So that's one of the trade-offs that you have to make. And then it comes to what style is the best for you. So that's the next decision that you have to make, is what style is the best? Do I want to be more aggressive? Do I want to be a little bit more like that diamond? Well, for me, there's two things. One, um, I think your penalty kill should almost mirror your five-on-five -five play a little bit. 
Um, I think that's important for your guys to understand. And then you look at your personnel. What type of players do you have um, that you could use with your kill? Are they big, long guys with big reaches? Are they guys that are committed to eating pucks and blocking shots? All those things come into play if you want to get yourself into a little bit more of that diamond formation. Are they quick? Are they really good with their edges? Do they think it really well? Are their sticks really good? Or do they have the ability to get on top of people in a hurry so they don't have time to make plays? Well, maybe that's something that allows you to go to that more aggressive style. But the common denominator always with your kill, no matter what you want to go to, is the teamwork and the communication. So you know you're short a guy on the ice. You have to work really well um, as a group of penalty killers, and you have to make sure you communicate. And that's some, some of the key things that I'll talk about, and you'll see in some of these clips I'm going to get to in a second. But for us, how do you go about teaching as I start to lead into the different types of exchanges or switches that you have to prepare for? How do you go about teaching these things? Well, the first thing for me is you have to get the players to understand what you're looking to try to do. And for us, we're about protecting the middle of the ice, even with our penalty kill. So we have to get the guys to understand the importance of dot lines. So I'm going to give you a few examples of that uh, and getting the players' minds wrapped around protecting the middle of the ice. From there, it's introducing your structure. So you give the guys some guidelines and rules so they've been in situations before us. Typically, this is how we handle this situation. So they understand what our routes are going to be, what our reps are going to be. It gives them an idea of what, what they have to be prepared for. And then the next biggest thing, the fundamentals. Where is your stick going to be? How do your feet go, your toes? We talk about protecting the middle of the ice. Everything we do, there has to be a plan to it. So we're always in a position where we always have numbers inside and we make it really hard for power plays to get through or to the middle of the ice on us. And it kind of goes to what Pete was saying earlier. He wants the offensive guys to get inside. Well, we want to make sure we keep them outside because that's where we feel we have the greatest chance of success is when we're forcing them to take low percentage or low quality shots. So the next biggest thing, guys, before I get to some of the video clips, um, is the repetition. And we all know power plays, they get all the time in practice. Um, I am a passionate penalty kill guy, and I wish that we gave our guys more opportunity to do that. But everybody wants their power play to get the work. And that's just the way it is. And a lot of times nowadays, your penalty killers are also power play guys. So teams are using their top players to kill penalties. So when you're running it in practice, a lot of times those guys don't get any reps at all. So then your video becomes priority. And I would say, be consistent with your video. Show them situations where these switches are going to take place. Show them doing it right. And then you find a way to get to the guys, whether it's individual, as pairs, or in your group meetings, and exactly how you expect them to work and exactly how you expect them to look. And the last point that I do have for you, partners and pairs, so important. Because there's gray area all over the place with penalty kills. Power plays have freedom to do a lot of things now. So if you have guys that kill together all the time, they know what the other guy wants to do. They know that guy's tendency. Um, so there doesn't have to be as much this verbal communication. It's more about eye contact. It's the nonverbals that come into play. So you eliminate the gray if you have the ability to keep your killers together, forwards and defensemen. So when I talk about exchanges, there's a couple different ones. I'm going to be very quick on the first two points. Face-offs and that up-ice pressure, that's something that... Um, for our team, we believe in being aggressive all over the place, as I said. Um, and then I'm going to spend more time on what we want to do in zone. How those switches come to be situations where our guys have to be ready for as we move ourselves forward here. So the first one, as I mentioned, is that face-off exchange. So for our team, typically what we want to see is we want our centerman to work himself out in lane, working inside out, and our winger that's on the inside there, he's getting out in that shot lane to start with right off the hop. So this is what we kind of want to look like. We want to always try to force that puck down the wall when we can, and then we're in a position where we are, are ready to read and ready to jump to kill plays before they happen. Now, a lot of times in the NHL, the pre-scout's an, uh, an important thing for us. So our job as coaches is to make sure the players are aware of tendencies of other teams. Pete talked about Hurdle earlier. Well, a lot of times when we watch games, you see how good he is at picking a centerman. So this is an example. There's no chance our centerman's getting out there in time to have an impact on pushing that puck down the wall. So part of our pre-scout is, hey, these centermen do an unreal job, so you guys as forwards have to make sure that you're ready to switch. We put it in their minds. There might be an opportunity for an exchange or a switch, and you guys have to communicate if something is happening on the fly that you're not prepared for. So we come into Dallas, and this is a situation, again, Jamie Benn is a big centerman. He does a really good job of getting in our centerman's way so he can't come out and do his job. So we tell him beforehand, 
this is an exchange situation. If you're stuck in these situations, communicate, talk, and we have to have the winger go out and take that centerman's job. So you'll see our winger come out. He's patient to start with. Then he's going to force his man back down the wall while our centerman exchanges and comes back to the middle of the ice. We still end up in the right position the way we want pushing that puck down the wall. Okay, the second thing is that up ice pressure. And we are also believers in, hey, if it's nobody's puck up the ice, why not kill 10, 15 seconds up there if we can? Put them in a situation where that power play breakout's not ready for us to get that pressure up the ice. Make them make plays that they're, they're uncomfortable making. So this is an example of the switches and exchanges that you need from your forwards if you want to pressure up the ice. So F1's job is to make sure he pressures that puck hard. You want to make that defenseman or that goalie move the puck. When you lose that pressure, his feet always come back to the middle. So again, it comes back to your structure. It comes back to your fundamentals as you're working here. F2 has to work with them. So you'll see in this situation, we lose or that puck moves like we want to see. F1's toes always have to come back to the middle of the ice. F2 then picks up that pressure. So we're always covered in the middle. You never want to put yourself in a situation where you lose two forwards up the ice. So again, number 11 for us loses pressure again. Here comes his partner in. Number 11's feet are always back to the middle of the ice. So you always have that rotation where we are always covered off in the middle. And one more example of it for you. First guy's up the ice and they force that poor pass. So F1 knows once this puck moves, his feet are always coming back to our own zone. So he's recovering back through the middle of the ice hard. F2 is recognizing it and he's up with his partner. Down he comes now, but we always have that filled coming back through the middle of the ice. It allows us to keep pressure on and it allows us to be in a position where should something happen down low that F1 loses his feet or he falls or something, we still have the ability to have the numbers in the neutral zone where we can deflect pucks coming into the zone. So there's two examples of, of exchanges, I guess, that you can look at face-offs and up-ice. So the majority of the time that you're going to see the trickier parts are your in-zone exchanges. So how do you work together in these situations, and how do you keep that pressure constant? That's the biggest thing for us here. So the first clip is just a little bit about our structure. So we know, as I mentioned earlier, the number one job for us is to protect the middle of the ice. So we use a lot of dot line. So because we are aggressive, our F1 is going to push this flanker or number 24 for Buffalo down that flank. So his job is to be aggressive there. No time to make plays. If he doesn't have pressure by around that dot height, um, the face-off circle dot height, his job is to fall back inside that dot line, which is the red dot line that I drew for you there. So we always want to have people coming back inside so the middle of the middle of the ice is protected for us. So you see it again here. So he falls back inside. Now the read starts. So if the defenseman up top for us is outside the dots, like you see him up top here for Buffalo, that F1 that was the initial pressure down guy, he's the guy that reattacks again. So he's going to come right back up in shot lane and he's going to force him back down the wall again while our F2 kind of holds the middle of the ice and he's ready to go um, on any wide pass, which you'll see later on. So no switch, no exchange necessary there. Same situation. This is where our first switch or exchange comes into play. Same thing. F1's going to push it down the wall as hard as he can. Dot line's an important thing for us again. So we know exactly what we're trying to do. We want to keep pressure on this guy coming down the flank, but we also want to make sure we have that presence in the middle of the ice. So he doesn't have pressure anymore, that F1, as he's pushing down. So his feet and his toes are always coming back inside that dot line because the D-man now... The next rule or read that our forwards have to make, because that D-man is inside the dot line, it's F2's responsibility now to come out and pressure. Okay, so that's our first switch, our first exchange, where the guys have to read off of where that D-man is up top. So our F2 in the middle of the ice is under control in shot lane. Wherever that puck moves, he picks up the pressure to put um, that weak side flanker in a situation where he has to hurry his decision, while our first guy always returns back to the middle of the ice. So that's our first switch type situation. And this clip kind of illustrates it a little bit better. And it's a forward up top acting like a D-man. That's pretty obvious to see, though. He's well inside the dots. So in this situation, our F1, he's recovering back inside. F2 knows my job is to make sure I'm in shot lane. I have to eat these pucks here when, the, when that shot happens. Whatever direction that puck moves to, he's going to follow that pass, and he's going to pressure down to keep them outside that dot line. Okay, the next thing. 
and these come to your rules. This structure comes to your rules. The wide top pass is what we call it. So these D-men are the D-men up top and the flanker. They're outside the dot lines. So again, everything comes back to these dot lines all the time. So D-men's outside dot line. So our, our forward's job, again, that's his responsibility. If they make a pass to the far dot line or far wall, this is an exchange or a switch for us. So you'll see our forward fall back inside. Partner picks up the pressure to keep the pressure constant on that flanker, trying to push him down the wall. The sticks and toes are always coming back to the middle. And as I said, it's always about protecting the middle of the ice. So once we get to an area where we can't pressure anymore, our forward falls back inside. So we always have coverage protecting the middle of the ice. Another example of it here, forward's responsibility again. He's outside the dot, so he's working his way out in shot lane. They make that wide pass up top. There's the exchange from our forwards. Again, toes and sticks back to the middle of the ice. We're covered off in the middle here. And this last clip is the same thing. And this is where it becomes the gray area. Hey, if you kill with the same guys all the time, there's a tendency. We have one guy that makes his partner go all the way over all the time all the time it's just what they do and they're comfortable with it they understand what the other guy's going to do so hey i don't know if this guy's outside the dots or is he inside the dots they have to make that decision as they're as they're killing here so these two guys kill a lot together so his partner was going to go you can see him trying to keep coming or thinking he's going to come but there's communication and they have a good understanding of working with each other so now we have our exchange falls inside we force the pass and the shot's taken from outside the dot line the next phase of it as we start building into it here what happens when that D-man walks the middle of the ice? So he's starting to move here. So we know where that D-man is. He's outside the dot line, so F1's job is to get in lane and go with him. So he's working across. That pass gets made from inside the dot line, so everything kind of revolves around dot line. You're starting to hear the trend and see the trend here. Um, so once that pass is made, F1's job is to follow it. So as quick as he can, we want him to change sides and we want him to pressure down that far side while his partner holds the middle of the ice. So his partner's job in the middle is to not allow any seam. And this is where the important part of um, understanding your partner, knowing what you're trying to accomplish, you want to make sure you put yourself in a position where we still have pressure, but we're not giving up any seams coming through here. This clip keeps coming. It's identical again. Outside the dot line, we know whose responsibility that is. He's going to keep coming with the defenseman. Pass made from the middle of the ice. He's going to follow his pass while his partner holds the middle so there is no seam available. And we're going to continue to pressure that down as hard as we can so they don't have time on that flanker. And we do a really good job up top. Now this is where it gets a little bit more tricky. So these exchanges, when a D-man walks past that midpoint, we always talk about power plays wanting to move that puck across that midway point or that royal road, some guys call it that. That's the dangerous threat. Goalies hate it when they have to face those type of plays. So when D-men are really good and they walk across like this clip, this is an exchange switch as well. So the way we handle these, this guy again is with them. He's got to fall back into this area quickly to help take the seam away, and his partner's going to switch, and he's going to pick up pressure on the other side. So that's one of the trickier exchanges that we see. You see how they rotate, and again, we're able to keep pressure on them. And part of our job as coaches is that pre-scout. So I'll go back to Pete's team again here one of the best defensemen at walking the blue line so when we're looking at dallas coming in to play us next or something we remind our penalty killers hey pretty good chance with heiskin and up top he's going to take you across the blue line so be ready to switch so you put it in their minds earlier so they're understanding okay if i'm in this situation this is what we're doing so you see from edmonton they do it the same thing that we would do partner's going to pick up pressure on the other side quick switch up top threat's done okay now when you start putting it all together here so you look at the rules and you're putting them into place. D-man outside the dot line. Forward loses pressure. He's coming back inside. Same guy, D-man outside. He's responsible for getting up there. Now he's going to follow that pass as quick as we can. We've got the middle protected. We have pressure down the flank. He doesn't have puck pressure anymore. He falls back in the middle. D-man's in the middle of the ice. Here comes his partner. So a lot of it is being familiar. A lot of it is repetition, doing it over and over and over again. Allow your partners to be in these situations so they understand what they're doing. Same thing. Where's the D-man? Outside. Here comes the forward. There's a wide pass that we talked about. Loses pressure. His toes are always coming back in at that same dot height. Partner recognizes D-man's inside the dots. Under control, in lane, follows his pass hard. We have the middle of the ice protected, and that's all we're giving up because our pressure has been constant. And that's what you want your goaltenders to have to see is shots from the outside. And one last example of it. Lose pressure. Obvious where that D-man is. Partner in lane. Here comes the pressure. If they want to shoot from there. We're in a position where we can get in lanes and make our goalie's job much easier.
Okay, now as we move on to the next little phase of it, forwards and DMET. So these exchanges are a little bit different. So as I said, we want to keep that pressure constant as much as we can. We've got this forward in the middle of the ice again. This would be our F2. He's under control, and then he's going to follow his pass. His Follow the pass. But you get into these situations now again where we don't ever want to give them time to just reset. So sometimes when we get to that dot height, forward doesn't have that pressure anymore. He's going to fall in. We allow our defenseman to then pick up the pressure and push out. So our D-man now again, you'll see, forward's going to come in at that dot. Our D-man from, from the middle of the ice is going to pressure out. Here he comes. He forces him back down the wall, low into that corner. They throw a weak shot on net. Easy save. We know what's happening here. There's a wide pass from our forwards, but now there's the read and the exchange from our forward to D. So handing off the pressure, our D-man picking up the pressure, trying to push him down into the corner. Stick is always coming from the middle out. Reverse the top. We know what we have to do here now, and we're in good shape. Okay, and one last example of it here. We saw this clip earlier, but I love this clip because this is what we want to try to get ourselves to. D-man's going to pressure. We force the play back up top push it to the outside, and if we can get guys to shoot from here, at the end of the day, I'll show this clip to the guys the next day. This is what we want to look like. If they want to shoot from here and that goes in, that's on our goalie, right? So we do a good job as killers making sure their, their options are limited. We've got the middle covered. There's no seam available. Shots coming from outside the dot line. So that's ideal for us as to what we want to look like. Now we get into the situations, the last kind of clip, few clips or scenarios here for you guys. How do you handle that bumper and the flanker when they're moving around. So for us, it's pretty, our rules are pretty set and in stone. Whenever this bumper is higher up here, responsibility is always our forward. Where the issues come into play is where teams bring that bumper lower and that flanker on that weak side is moving. So we'll call this one the low bumper, high flanker. Our forward F2 in the middle of the ice, his job again, he's got to deny that seam. He's got to take that away. So that means our net front D-man is going to play mid, mid net to near post, and he's going to work to help take away any goal line play into that near bumper. So that's what we should like. We got the seam covered there to start with. So real easy clip. One more example of it. This is an easy read for our guys, but you'll see what we're trying to do here. So again, low bumper, high flanker. He's going to come downhill. So our D-man's ready to help with this goal line to here, and our forward's going to come off the backside ready for any play that's coming to that, that backside. So you see the check the shoulders. They're aware of what they're doing in that area skip that clip then we get to this one and i like this clip because this is a good one for for teaching and, and working with the guys so right now there's no movement we're all good we know what's happening and this is one of our better players in regards to reading plays and understanding what's going on he's really good at what he does so this flanker is going to move so you see the difference so he knows where he is he's checking his shoulders now he's dropped to the backside. so this is where the exchange come in comes into play and this is a harder one uh, and it takes some time for guys to work on it and guys to get comfortable with each other in these situations. So now the roles have switched. They've got a guy on the backside, which is now going to become our D-man's responsibility, and they have a higher bumper, which our forward is going gonna, is gonna to take over coverage on. So just like this example, you see our D-man at the net front. He kind of fades off to make sure there's no pass that's going to go from goal line to back door, and our forward that was originally responsible for the high guy, as he came down here, switches, and he takes this guy coming into here. So good stick kills the play. Okay, one more example of it here. So same thing, a little bit of gray area. So there's some communication going on. There's situations where there's gonna be movement here. So you see the net front guy pops, our back door defenseman is ready for any play now coming to the backside because of communication. And really a lot of times guys, it's, it's the non-verbals too. They know what's going on by checking their shoulders, but they're understanding because we prepare them for what they're gonna see be ready for these little pop plays, and they understand how to handle it. So now our forward's coming off the backside. D-man makes sure he denies any play. So those things happen quick, and I find they're the hardest thing to teach. This area, when you're talking about exchanges and switches, verbal, nonverbal, and this is just like a quick one here. So you see again, high flanker. Forward's got to make sure he has that seam up top. D-man in a position now as the puck moves to the goal line. We've got it covered. Taking away here. Forward's got our guy here. Gray area but you need everybody to work together because the quick puck movement and the skill of the power play, you need all guys connected. So the tighter we can make it inside, the better our sticks are in recovering. You see how all the sticks turn to the middle of the ice here? Um, you can help when someone misses an assignment. So that that's an example of it there. And the last one again, see how quick everything comes together. Back in shot lane, gonna push down again. There's movement at the front of the net. Two guys are ready to 
deny a plate of the backside and they're ready for the plate of the bumper. So the last little bit that I'll show you is the diamond approach, something that we don't use, but we do talk a lot about it to see if it's something that we want to get ourselves into. And there's just a couple differences with it. So that's it, pretty much. So remember what I said earlier, pros and cons. The con for me with this is you give up zone time. But then people will say, what does it matter if it's zone time if they're all staying to the outside? And it's a good point. And that's why we have those conversations all the time about it. Um, but that's typically what it looks like. You're responsible, responsible, responsible. So they'll give up the play into the middle from time to time, but that's an easier play for your goaltender to adjust to and make a save on. So again, now you see what we would do here in these situations. So for us, demon in the middle of the ice is moving, and we're using Winnipeg as an example. So if this was Calgary, we would have followed that pass hard, like I talked, because that demon's inside the dot line, but not so much here. Now you have responsibilities to come out in this area, and this forward's falling right back in. So the reads are a little bit less. You have your areas, whether you're locking the right side, um, you have different responsibilities. So again, crosses that halfway point for us. For us, this would have been a switch where this guy's coming out to pressure and he's falling back down, but it, not the same for the diamond. Now it's this net front for this defenseman on this flank, it's his responsibility to get out. So you watch how far he'll come and, and flex out on this guy. So it's a little bit different, but it's at times I feel like it might be a little less thinking for your players. They understand where they have to be. And then one more example of it. Out comes that defenseman where we would have pushed that down a little bit more aggressively, but the result is often the same. So there's different ways to look at it and we talk about it a lot um you want to make sure that you you know what's best for your team to me that's the biggest thing here is, is finding out what's best for your team in regards to how you you want to kill switches are a hard part there's a lot of communication that comes along with it and there's a lot of you know they need a lot of practice time with it so for us there's a couple things that you can do with your practice when you're teaching this and again this is back to our style of the way we typically would kill you can start your drills simply before practice, after practice with what you want to do, but you'll have that forward on the, on the wall. Just skate with the puck down to start with, about the bottom of that hash mark area, and make that play up top. So you set your three guys up top like they would in a power play situation where um, you're trying to recreate the initial rotation that you want. So this is a wide pass. So now your forwards will re-attack, and they're going to exchange your switch. And then you have them play it out for a few minutes until the penalty kill either gets a stick on puck and knocks it away, or you've seen enough of the three on two, you blow it down. So you try to keep the offensive guys into this area. So as they're moving back and forth, you're playing a little three on two high. Um, it puts your penalty killers in situations where they have to make the reads that you're working on. Second time you go through it, you can have that D-man walk. So it starts with a simple pass. So it's simply putting your forwards in positions where, okay, he's walking. I got to go with him. Um, now I have to make that read as to where that pass gets made. So let them play out that three on two again off the initial set so they understand what they're looking to do what their responsibilities are as they move forward and then it's the same thing how do we create a different switch where he's brought me across the blue line like you saw the one clip and then the, the dallas clip there guys earlier where f2 is coming underneath and pressuring once you do that let them play it out for a little bit keep them basically bottom hash mark and higher don't let them get any lower and then you can work on your d and forward exchanges the exact same way you put them on one half of the ice Forward's going to walk down the wall in this situation into this area, like trying to get a little bit lower, so we'll push him down, lose that pressure, he'll fall in, and then your D-man's going to pick up the pressure, try to push him down. Let them move the puck back up top so you just have your forwards and D-man reset and do it again. So those are, those are a few little drills that you can use and utilize as you, as you try to build your penalty kill as what you want to do, as to what you want to do. Um, but I love the penalty kill. I think it's something that... Um, I don't want to say underrated because you win and lose games based on your penalty kill and power play. So if your penalty kill is not where it needs to be, you've got to put the time in there with it. Um, and I think that's what these conferences are so good about. Um, Carla and Pete's presentation um, were awesome. And I go back and think about 10 years ago when I, I presented on penalty kill. I am so much different now than I was back then. My ideas and philosophies have changed along the way. Um, the details that you, you learn and pick up along the way from other coaches that you get to listen to speak. Um, it, it's, it's pretty neat, actually, to see how you adjust and how you change along the way. So uh, I'd just like to end by saying thank you very much. I appreciate your time, and I hope you were able to take something out of this, and you can keep pushing your penalty kill to higher and higher levels um, next season. Thank you.